In every generation, there is a chosen one. She alone will stand against the plot holes, the controversy, and the forces of fandom. She is Sierra. This probably would have been a different video if I was making it a couple of years ago. When I say that I used to be obsessed with Buffy, I mean that I used to own the Buffy Trivia Handbook, and I could tell you everything Cordelia orders with her cappuccino. Cinnamon, chocolate, half-calf, non-fat, extra foam. Have you ever tried the foam, by the way? It's disgusting. I don't know who likes the foam enough to ask for extra. I wasn't even, like, a regular Buffy fan back in the day. I was a geek. I genuinely looked up to Joss Whedon, and in order for you to understand why, I kind of want to break down this opening scene from Buffy for a second here. The show opens up on a typical horror setup, a girl and a guy breaking into a high school at night. She's uncertain. We're just gonna get in trouble. He's thinking about something else. Yeah, you can count on it. The girl looks away. <gasps> what was that? Hello? There's nobody here. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay. And when she turns around, she has vampire fangs. Cue that kick-ass intro with the iconic theme song by Nerf Herder. <laughs> This kind of subversion may be more common on TV shows nowadays, especially when you have things like Supernatural and WWBD. What would Buffy do? And Stranger Things that have clearly been inspired by Buffy. But back then, it was actually a pretty big deal. The Sopranos may have changed the way that television was made, but Buffy the Vampire Slayer changed the way television was written. There is a lot more discussion nowadays about whether or not Joss's writing style can technically be considered quote unquote quote, good. And I won't deny that he's definitely made a few bad movies. But Buffy the Vampire Slayer took its characters and its world building a lot more seriously than a lot of television, and especially a lot of fantasy did at the time, which really helped to set it apart from a lot of other 90s girl power TV shows, like my personal guilty pleasure, Xena Warrior Princess. That's right, crawl. Crawl for your stinking life! Little side note here, Xena is absolutely flawless, and I see no bad special effects or glaring plot holes. What are you talking about? Oh what is it? You are beautiful! But if we're gonna talk about Buffy, we gotta talk about that other side to it, too. I'm not gonna go into full detail about all the controversies quite yet, because some of it does involve the stars from Buffy, and some of it involves plot points I want to get into later. But for now, suffice it to say that Buffy's creator, Joss Whedon, is not a good guy. After the news first broke, I did go back and rewatch Buffy. I was in a weird mental state at the time, too. It was just after quarantine. And I just remember coming away from it with this whole attitude of like, oh my god, did you guys know that Buffy isn't good? As if I didn't already know it had always been cheesy. But no, I guess some of the show's more glaring issues just stood out a lot more starkly to me in wake of the recent news about Joss Whedon. I've always loved Buffy enough to be able to call it on its faults, but it's hard not to let those faults taint it a little bit nowadays. That being said, I'm sort of making this video at a middle ground right now. I feel less betrayed by the realization that Joss was a terrible person, and I think it's important to keep in mind that Buffy was a lot more than Joss anyway. Script writing was handled by Mutant Enemy, a production company that, yes, was created by Joss, but it also consisted of a huge team of writers who played a big part in shaping the show. And that isn't even to mention how much the stars clearly put into it, at least in the beginning. Sarah Michelle Gellar was very careful to never be photographed smoking or drinking back in the 90s because she wanted Buffy to be a role model to young girls. I don't think it's fair to dismiss all of their efforts because of the actions of one guy, and I also don't think it's fair to dismiss the way that Buffy has changed the lives of many fans for the better. I will be calling it out every time I see something I think the show did really well, but at the same time, there's a lot about my favorite show that maybe hasn't aged as well, and it's finally time for me to call it out. We have a lot of ground to cover here, so here's how we're gonna do it. This first video is going to cover the Buffy movie and the first season, and then every video from there is going to cover it season by season. 
In the end, I'll compile it all into one huge video like I did for my disturbing movies iceberg, okay? That way you can choose to either watch along with me or you can just binge it all in the end in one go, whichever you'd prefer. Make sure that you subscribe though so that you don't miss any of the other videos I have coming. Okay, now let's start at the beginning. Joseph Hill Whedon was born June 23rd, 1964 in New York to feminist activist and school teacher Anne Lee and American screenwriter Tom Whedon, who once worked briefly with Jim Henson on the 1969 Muppets movie, Hey Cinderella. I'll meet you guys over at Cinderella's in five minutes. I gotta go rent some horses. I hope that staple takes credit cards. What, too far back? Sorry, but there is a reason we might want to start with the story of Joss Whedon. Ask any Buffy fan and they'll tell you that at one point in time anyway, Buffy was Joss's baby. That would definitely change as the series went on, but he really fought hard to get it off the ground in the beginning. And that makes a lot more sense when you see where he started out. Joss was pretty much born into the industry. Even his grandfather was a writer on the Dick Van Dyke show. Thanks again for the meal. It gives me courage to go home and face another week of my wife's cooking. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean that he had an easy go of it in the beginning. If you know anything about Buffy, then you know that the subject of trauma is a huge theme there. And Joss has admitted to living with complex post-traumatic stress disorder ever since he witnessed the death of a friend at the age of four. His parents were divorced when he was nine years old, another life event that would go on to inspire a theme in Buffy. And his early work as a script doctor meant that he went uncredited for The Getaway, Speed, Waterworld, and Twister. Not a bragging point, I might add. Cow. I gotta go, Julia, we got cows! But we'll talk about Joss's whole approach to dialogue later. His first credited movie was actually the one we're gonna be talking about today, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, not to be confused by the TV show of the same name. You have been chosen, Buffy. To do what? To stop the vampires. Does Elvis talk to you? As he put it, Joss said that he wanted to subvert the cliche of the little blonde girl who goes into a dark alley and gets killed in every horror film. He came up with the first version of her character shortly after graduating from Wesleyan University in 1987. Back then, her name was Rhonda the Immortal Waitress, with his main idea behind her being the idea of a seemingly insignificant female who, in fact, turns out to be extraordinary. The name Buffy was chosen because it sounded to Joss like something you'd hear in a B-horror movie. And thus, television history was born. Movie history? Not so much. The Buffy movie is an entirely different animal from the series. 20th Century Fox didn't like Joss's sense of humor, so they removed a lot of his jokes. Plus, they thought his script was way too dark and that the movie would work better as a lighthearted comedy. You can see the kind of tone this movie is going for right from its opening scene. Let Satan tremble. The Slayer is born. We get a little bit of backstory on what a slayer is, along with medieval costumes that look like something out of a community theater production, before cutting immediately to Buffy cheerleading in the present day. This movie, more than the TV series, is responsible for the association that Buffy is a cheerleader, by the way. We'll talk about that more when we get to the series, but her being a cheerleader comes up a lot in this movie. How funky is your chicken? How loose? is your goose. A goose is totally loose. So come on all you hot fans and shake your caboose. But before we move on, what exactly is the Slayer? The Slayer is the one girl from every generation who's been mystically called upon to defend us all from vampires and demons. One Slayer dies and the next is chosen. That's the part of the Slayer lore that's going to stay more or less the same. The rest of the details are all going to change. For one thing, this movie makes it clear that Slayers are born with a mole on their chest. This is actually a pretty big deal because it's how the Slayer's watcher is able to identify her. Buffy only doesn't have hers anymore because she had it surgically removed at some point in the past. That big ol' hairy mole? <laughs> Ew, I had that thing removed. For the record, as much as Buffy says that moles are gross, this movie made me totally proud of my birthmarks because I 100% thought when I was a kid that it meant that I was going to be a slayer, even though literally none of those moles were on my chest. 
I'm calling this dude the Watcher, by the way, because that's pretty much what his role would have been if this were the series. Watchers are meant to guide and train the Slayer, but again, how exactly they function is going to change hugely as we go on. In the movie, Merrick says that he's always been the one to guide the Slayer, and that he's reborn again and again, with his sole purpose in every life being to find the Slayer and train her until the day she's ready. You just keep on living the same old life? Yes. Until there aren't any more vampires? Then what? Oh, then maybe I'll go to heaven. That isn't a story we're ever going to hear again. The series doesn't really get into it until season two, but there, the Watchers are just kind of guys. There's a whole Watchers Council. They send out guys as they're needed. But there's only really, like, one Watcher that trains each Slayer until she dies because the Watchers are never expecting the Slayers to have a long lifespan on the show. It is way darker than the movie. Trust me, get out now if you value your innocence. Buffy's Watcher in the movie is played by Donald Sutherland, and he was actually the reason why Joss wound up leaving the movie early in its production. Joss and Donald just didn't get along. Donald had a habit of ad libbing lines, which usually would be okay. You can always cut out anything that doesn't work in post, and I'm a huge believer in the idea that the script is a living thing that others can bounce ideas off of. But Joss really hated Donald for doing it. He called him a real pain to work with, and accused Donald of destroying the entire movie, saying, I pretty much eventually threw up my hands because I could not be around Donald Sutherland any longer. I'm not sure if Joss was just frustrated with the entire situation, and decided to take it out on Donald for some reason, but it seems to me that there was way more Ron with this movie than just the one actor. Buffy here is played by Christy Swanson. She probably does a better valley girl routine than Sarah does on the series. Excuse me for not knowing about El Salvador. Like, I'm ever going to Spain anyway. But Sarah definitely feels a lot more human. In the movie, when Buffy finds out she's the Slayer, she's resistant at first. All I want to do is graduate from high school, go to Europe, marry Christian Slater, and die. Dude, I think I had the same bucket list when I was in high school. Chaos is what killed the dinosaurs, darling. But she thinks it's cool that she can catch a blade in midair. <laughs> oh, I, I never hit anybody before. Well, you did it perfectly. I didn't even break a nail. And she wants to see where Merrick's going with this. That's it. Those are our stakes here. T stakes. Buffy also learns that she has special slayer powers, like the ability to get cramps whenever vampires are near. You had the cramps? Yeah, I felt them a little. But I'm not due for another couple of weeks since you're so hot on the subject. It was a natural reaction on the part of a slayer, a reaction to their unnatural. This has to be the stupidest thing I have ever heard. How did no woman on set think to say, hey, when I get my period, the last thing I want to do is fight demons. I'm sorry. My secret weapon is PMS. That idea was written down, edited, approved by the studio, and delivered out of the actors' faces. And not once did anyone point out that it was the worst idea in the world. The vampires in this movie are all pretty cheesy, too. The late, great Paul Rubens is definitely the most memorable one, and can we just admit that the moment when the vampire kid, Lothos, floats down from the sky is pretty great? Oh my god. This actress could not care less. Are you? But even Paul Rubens is using Joss's habit of dialogue that sounds like the characters are aware they're in a movie. You ruined my new jacket. Kill him a lot. And his death scene. Oh god, his death scene. You're gonna wish you died. And by that he means he's gonna drag it out so long, you're gonna wish you had died. Ah. Joss's approach to dialogue is so unique that it's often referred to among fans as Buffy speak. The language of Buffy is really the language of Joss Whedon. A lot of it is the way Joss naturally speaks. Joss insisted on all script writers on the show using his approved set of slang. And I feel like it works there just because each character still has their distinctive way of speaking. A doodle. I do doodle. You too. You do doodle too. It's more a verbal, non-verbal. Shop and hang out and go to school and save the world from unspeakable demons. You know, I want to do girly stuff. And it's helped keep the show feeling pretty timeless, if we're being honest. Slaying changes pretty quickly, but Buffy Speak never really dates itself because it never really existed to begin with. 
But when you do it badly, and even Joss has done it badly before, it kind of sounds like you're just making up your own idea of how teenagers speak with no connection to the real world. And look, Ben Affleck in an early role. He has one line and it had to be dubbed over in post. Take it, man. This clearly isn't a good movie, but how many of these characters do you need to be aware of going into the series? None of them. Literally not one, not even Buffy. If you can go into the series completely unaware of what the movie is, you're probably better off to be honest. So it's a good thing we covered the movie first, huh? The series really suffered for being attached to the movie at first, too. When it was first announced, the general attitude that everyone seemed to have about the series was... Really? They're making a spin-off to that shitty movie? Joss was really attached to his original script for the Buffy movie, and it would eventually be more or less published in comic book form in 1999's Buffy the Vampire Slayer The Origin. Joss has accepted that series as being close enough anyway, and he's also praised it for basing their illustrations of Merrick on the actor who would eventually be cast to play him in flashbacks on the series. And not, to put in his words, a certain other thespian who shall remain hated. Seriously, what is his deal with Donald Sutherland? But the series serves as a sequel to Joss's original script, not the movie that we got. The movie was the product of the studio, so characters will reference things happening that just straight up didn't happen in the movie. The TV series picks up after Buffy has been kicked out of school for burning down the gym. Her parents have gotten divorced and she's moving with her mom to a new town called Sunnydale. None of this is so much as hinted at in the movie. The movie does end with Buffy fighting vampires in the school gym, and it's probably the best scene in the movie. This is when the movie really lets go and has fun with itself. I love the principal handing out detention slips to dead vampires. Detention, detention. Detention, detention. And Hilary Swank inviting the vampires in because they're seniors. It's just great, but Buffy doesn't burn down the gym. She just saves the day and rides into the sunset on the back of Luke Perry's motorcycle. He's her love interest in the movie, but I have very little to say about him besides that he looks like a mix between Angel and Spike here. It's the weirdest thing to me. He's been written out of the series entirely. Buffy doesn't miss him or mention him, so I guess he just doesn't exist there. It's a shame, too. I feel like a lot of Buffy's problems on the series could have been solved if he did. He's basically her perfect man. Buffy's parents also aren't fighting in the movie like they're implied to have been in the series. Instead, her parents are just absent-minded and not overly concerned about Buffy. And you can still see how that hurts her. Do you know what time it is? <sighs> Around 10? <sighs> I knew this thing was slow. You pay a fortune for something. Honey, come on, we're gonna be late! I kind of love this moment here because it's so subtle. She's coming back from fighting vampires for the first time and her parents don't even notice that anything's wrong. She just quietly goes upstairs and cuddles with her demons, all of which is kept in an almost lullaby-like silence that really gets to me. There were definitely moments in the movie that managed to be strong, but when you compare it to the darkness of the TV series, there's just no competition. After the opening credits, we're introduced to a major theme for Buffy, which is that she often dreams about things that haven't happened yet. Buffy's dreams are often used as a way to explore her trauma as well, but here it's mostly just a way for the show to give you a glimpse of what's to come in season one. A lot of shots of the Master, who's sort of our big bad this season. The Master feels like he's supposed to be more important than he is. He's among the oldest recorded vampires out there, but later on we'll find out that he's not even the oldest. Mainly, he's just your typical evil vampire who kind of looks like Nosferatu. He's been trapped underground for the last 60 years and our good guys have to stop him before he gets free. We'll talk about the master more later though. For now, Buffy has to go to school. You see, even though Buffy already knows that she's the Slayer and she's already hunted vampires, she's kind of trying to take a break from that world for the sake of her mom who has no idea that she's the Slayer. She's already gotten herself in trouble for burning down the school gym, and her mom clearly doesn't want Buffy to let her down again. And honey, try not to get kicked out. I promise. Joss had originally planned on keeping Buffy's parents off screen for the entirety of the series, but he wrote Joyce in when he realized that this would be hard to keep going. And thank God he did too. She's mostly here just to be Buffy's mom in season one, but she goes on to be a badass later, trust me. You get the hell away from my daughter. 
By the way, does that high school exterior look familiar to you at all? That's Torrance High, the same school that's used for Beverly Hills 90210. Once we're at Sunnydale High, the show goes around introducing us to all of our most important characters, so why don't we just take a minute to do that real quick? Giles is Buffy's watcher. He's played by Anthony Head, who's actually a bit of a celebrated actor in the UK. You may recognize him if you've ever seen Percy Jackson's Sea of Monsters, or the Merlin BBC series, or a personal favorite of mine, Repo the Genetic Opera. No one wants a thankless job! Giles is going to change a lot as the series goes forward, but this season he's just sort of the designated adult. The lifespan of a Buffy fan is such. First, you think that Giles is old. Things involved in the computer fill me with a childlike terror. Then you think that Giles is hot. To be the sad man. Then you are Giles. Is that why you're always cleaning your glasses? So you don't have to see what we're doing? Tell no one. Giles works in the school library, and Buffy first meets him when she's just looking for some books for class. But he comes at her hard and fast with the whole vampire thing and chases her out the door. And right into our next member of the group, Alexander Harris, usually called Xander on the show. Xander is played by Nicholas Brendan, who unfortunately hasn't enjoyed as much success in recent years. His most relevant appearance might have to be the time that he appeared on Dr. Phil to discuss his issues with alcohol abuse and depression, which was just awful. You can clearly tell that Dr. Phil was just exploiting his trauma for views. I have absolutely no problem with Nicholas Brendan walking off stage. He did what was right to protect himself. For the record, Nicholas Brendan has said that his relationship with Joss was difficult on the set for Buffy, but he refused to go into any more detail than that. Going back to the show for a second, Buffy finds the body of the boy who was killed in the intro stuffed in a locker, and she quickly figures out that he was killed by vampires. Oh, great. She goes to Giles, demanding to know what's going on. He explains that their school is sitting on something called a hellmouth that attracts monsters right to them. And Xander overhears all of this. What? So clearly he's going to be involved, but more than anything this season, Xander's main purpose is to set up some sort of love triangle. It's more of a love square, really, but anyway. Xander's crushing on Buffy, and he's totally oblivious to the fact that his best friend Willow is crushing on him. Willow is the one who really rounds out our group of heroes here. Willow, right? Why? I, I mean, hi. Uh, did you want me to move? She's played by Allison Hannigan, best known for How I Met Your Mother and American Pie. Oh, and this one time at band camp? There is an unaired pilot for Buffy that more or less follows the same events as the first episode, but it's still worth bringing up to mention the fact that Willow was played by Riff Reagan from Sisters in the pilot. I'm Willow. <laughs> Good to meet you. It is so weird to see Buffy refer to someone else as Willow. Alison Hannigan was the perfect casting choice. She is easily the strongest actress here. That won't be something that's super obvious until next season, when the show really starts to take a darker turn. This season, Willow's main role is just to be the innocent one. She's a little more childish than the others. Nice dress. Good to know you've seen the softer side of Sears. Oh, well, well my mom picked it and because of that, she's always getting herself kidnapped and rescued this season. This episode also introduces us to Jesse, Xander's friend, played by Eric Balfour, who you may recognize if you've ever seen Haven or 2003's Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Cordelia, played by Charisma Carpenter. We will be talking about Charisma Carpenter going forward, but the first time we meet Cordelia, she's just sort of your typical popular mean girl. Know your losers. Once you can identify them all by sight, they're a lot easier to avoid. She invites Buffy out to the only cool place in town, The Bronze, an under-18 club with live music that the show mostly uses as a means to highlight different bands. The music on this show really was a big part of setting the mood, and you can see how that's managed to live on in shows like Supernatural. On her way to the bronze, Buffy runs into the next character we'll be introduced to, Angel, who's really kept in the shadows, both literally and figuratively. What do you want? The same thing you do. What do I want? To kill him. To kill them all. 
Sorry, that's incorrect. What I want is to be left alone. He warns Buffy that something bad is coming and then leaves. Yeah, she's never seen him before this moment either. Buffy runs into Willow at the bronze and she encourages her to break out of her shell a little bit. Seize the moment, because tomorrow you might be dead. Then she runs into Giles in one of his rare appearances at the bronze. We find out that Giles has no idea who Angel is either and he asks her to pick a vampire out of the crowd, which she does with no problem. Who in your senses? There's one. You don't know. Oh, please. Deal with that outfit for a moment. It's dated. It's carbon dated. Only someone living underground for 10 years would think that was still the look. That's one of the great things about Buffy. Giles expects her to learn the old ways and do things the way they've always been done. But Buffy's strengths lie in her femininity and her ability to be fully present. And the two of them work best when they're together. Buffy also doesn't have any stupid PMS powers in this series, which is a good thing. She just figures out whether or not someone's a vampire the old-fashioned way. And speaking of vampires, remember that advice Buffy gave Willow? What's she doing? Seizing the moment. This guy turns out to be a servant of the master who's trying to lure Willow back to the graveyard for him to feed on. Oh, and Jesse gets lured back too. He gave me a hickey. I got hungry on the way. This blonde vampire from the opening is named Darla. She's sort of important, more so on the Buffy spin-off series Angel, which yes, I am playing planning on talking about after my Buffy run-through. But on this series, Darla mostly exists to be the one servant of the Master you're going to see most often. Darla is later established to be the Master's favorite, sort of like his surrogate daughter. But in this first episode, we see that Darla is very afraid of this other vampire named Luke who actually seems to be the master's favorite. Buffy breaks in to save the day. Where would Willow go? Are you serious? We don't find her, and there's gonna be one more dead body in the morning. And we get some dialogue that I think proves why Joss's style works better here than pretty much anywhere else. We can do this the hard way, or, well, actually, there's just the hard way. That's fine with me. Are you sure? Now this is not gonna be pretty. We're talking violence, strong language. In the movie, when characters talked as though they knew they were in a movie, it was distracting and unnatural. When Buffy does it, it feels like she's seen all this before and she's pretty used to it. Buffy, so used to doing these things that are so operatic and huge and the stuff of Norse mythology and to her, it's like, yeah, and then I go. But when Luke enters the fight, all bets are off. The first episode ends on a cliffhanger, trying to make you think that Luke's taken a bite out of the Slayer. Which, of course, isn't true, because this would be a very short series if it were. Episode 2 is called The Harvest, and it picks up where our last episode left off, with Buffy, Willow, and Xander running away to safety, but they have to leave Jesse behind. Our heroes meet in the library to talk about what to do next, and they agree that since Buffy is the Slayer, she should be the one to go back for Jesse, although Xander isn't liking this plan. Buffy goes back to the graveyard where she runs into Angel. He warns her about the harvest, which is basically the night that the master's servants are planning on killing a whole bunch of people to bring him back to full strength. We also find out that the master doesn't like Angel, so there's that. Buffy hears him out, but she still goes down into the vampire's lair to find Jesse. That's when we find out that Xander's been following her because he wants to help find Jesse. They come across him chained to a wall, but when they set him free, they find out that the whole thing was a trap and that Jesse's been turned into a vampire. Jesse's death was supposed to be a surprise for the audience. Joss wanted the first episode to have a special version of the intro that would include Eric Balfour as a regular cast member, so that we would all be tricked into thinking he was meant to stick around. This turned out to be either too expensive, too time consuming, or both for them to do, depending on where you look. But in either case, that first episode treats him as just another potential friend of Buffy's. And credit to the show. Anytime a friend is lost, we always take a moment to feel it. Once they get away and get back to the school library, Xander's reaction is very human here. I don't like vampires. I'm gonna take a stand and say they're not good. This will be the moment Xander really joins the fight against the undead. For Willow, she's just happy to have friends. You see, I believe enemies are coming. Stop right there. I'm in. You are? Yeah, I, I need friends. So our group is together, and the gang make their way down to the bronze to stop the master's servants before they can start the harvest. And there's this speech from Giles here I just wanted to point out real quick. Jesse is dead. You have to remember that when you see him, you're not looking at your friend, you're looking at the thing that killed him. Okay, so that's our vampire lore. 
That's why it's okay for us to kill them, because they're demons now with absolutely no connection to who they were as humans. Hold on to that, because I'm gonna have issues with that lore as we go on. The vampires in this show turn to dust when you stake them, by the way. Which is something that they didn't do in the movie. This was mostly because Joss didn't want a high school-aged girl to have to deal with the reality of cleaning up corpses every episode. And because it looks really cool. Demons, on the other hand, don't turn to dust, but we won't be seeing a whole lot of those until later on. This episode does a decent job of setting up its vampire lore, by the way. As soon as they got clear of the graveyard, they could have just... Boom. They can fly? They can drive. The vampires in the Buffy movie could fly, and that was actually a pretty common thing for vampires to do back in the 80s and early 90s. Making their vampires more grounded was a great way for the series to not only set itself apart from the movie, but to tell us that they were taking their vampires a lot more seriously this time around. This first season had some problems here and there with their vampire prosthetics. The actor who played Luke especially struggled to speak. Tonight! will be history at its end. And after that, all vampires with speaking roles were given an updated set of prosthetics that they still struggle to speak with, if we're being honest. You're sick, and you'll always be sick. And the henchmen were all wearing the old prosthetics, so they look even more ridiculous. But outside of that, and that mostly had to do with the fact that they were working with, like, no budget, by the way, the vampires on this series were a lot more realistic than they had been in media for a long time. But anyway, Xander dusts Jesse and Buffy dusts Luke, stops the harvest, delays the master's plans, and our gang goes off to think of ways that Buffy can get kicked out of school again without causing too much damage. I was thinking of a more subtle approach, you know, like excessive not studying. The earth is doomed. Episode 3, which has a slightly different tone than the first two episodes. Those first two episodes were very plot-driven, but of the 12 episodes that we're gonna get this season, eight of them are just kind of filler. That isn't to say that they're bad episodes, that's just to say that you can tell the writers didn't get their foot in until about season two. The first season of Buffy really reminds me of Supernatural in the sense that it's just episodic monster hunting, and so your love for this season is really going to depend on how much you can tolerate that. Which is also the only episode of the TV series that actually shows Buffy having an active interest in cheerleading. She tries out for the team, much to Giles' disapproval. You are the Slayer. Lives depend upon you. Allowances for your youth, but I expect a certain you amount of response. Enslave yourself to this, this cult? You don't like the color? She sees cheerleading as a way to get back to her normal, and she really wants to make the team to prove to her mom that she isn't going to mess up again. I'm glad you're taking that up again. It'll keep you out of trouble. I'm not in trouble. No, not yet. It's kind of sad to me, the way that this episode makes it clear that nothing Buffy does will ever be enough for her mom. To her, making the cheerleading squad should be enough, but her mom would rather see her on something like the yearbook team. Maybe you should think about joining the yearbook staff. I did it, it was a lot of fun. This just in, I'm not you. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Buffy shows up for tryouts, but she doesn't get her chance to, because one of the other cheerleaders just randomly catches fire. She's not the only cheerleader who has this sort of thing happen to her either. This girl gets what looks like Play-Doh smeared over her mouth, and Charisma Carpenter cannot keep her eyes open with those white-out contacts in. This leads our heroes to suspect that there may be a witch targeting the cheerleading team, and they've got to move quick now that Buffy's on the team. This episode introduces us to another character we've got to keep our eye on, Amy, an alternate on the cheerleading team who takes it all a little too seriously. She kind of mirrors Buffy's relationship with her mom, but like amped up by a hundred. Amy's mom was a cheerleading legend in high school, and even though Amy trains with her mom six hours a day, I train with my mom three hours in the morning, three at night. She still can't seem to get the moves right. She trains with her mom like three hours a day. Uh-huh. Sounds like her mom's pretty into it. Sounds like her mom doesn't have a lot to do. She was trying to bond with you, Joyce. Take the bait. Amy is obviously the one casting the vengeance spells here, but there's a twist. You know, before she suddenly got into cheerleading, Amy used to be really into brownies. And when Buffy and Giles go to Amy's mom to warn her about what her daughter's been up to. Ever since dad, her dad left, I can't control her. They notice a plate of brownies. Amy? Are you Amy? She switched your bodies, didn't she? She said I was wasting my youth, so she took it. 
This episode may be cheesy. That line haunts me in a way I can't explain. During this scene, Buffy is in the middle stages of her curse. It started out with her basically acting drunk. Willow! Xander! My buds are here! I love my buds! But then she becomes sick for pretty much the rest of the episode. We get her first hint that Giles is a magic user in his own right because he's the one who performs the spell that switches Amy and her mom back to their correct bodies. But this also breaks all of Amy's mom's curses, meaning that Buffy is able to kick her butt. I'm going to put you where you can't make trouble again. Guess what? I feel better. But obviously, Buffy can't kill her. She's still a teenage girl here, and witch or not, Amy's mom would leave a pretty human-looking corpse they'd need to deal with. So instead, Buffy reflects one of her curses back at her, trapping her in one of her own cheerleading statues. <laughs> This episode's memorable, if only for being the only time on the show we'd actually see Buffy wearing a cheerleading outfit. Cheerleading just a little too hairy for me these days. It introduced witches into the Buffy verse, although you can really tell that they weren't what witches would become later on the series. Buffy's usually surprisingly respectful when it comes to witchcraft. It's because witches, they were persecuted, wicked, good, and love the earth and women power, and I'll be over here. It's weird to hear them being so cliche in season one. Do you actually ride a broom? This episode is also the first one that really gets into Xander's crush on Buffy. You could tell he thought she was hot in the first episode, and he put his foot in his mouth when they first met. Can I have you? Uh, <laughs> can I help you? But by the third episode, he's already given her engraved jewelry. Here's a good luck thing for triads. Yours always. It, it came that way, really. They all said that. And we get this exchange when Buffy is in the early stages of her curse, and she's still acting drunk. Do you have any idea why I love you so, Xander? You gotta get her to let her speak. You're not like other boys at all. You are totally and completely one of the girls. I'm that comfy with him. That's great. Where I see love, she sees a friend. This is going to be even more important when we get into episode four, Teacher's Pet. This one starts out with Xander being cool. He stakes the vampires, rescues Buffy, and even has enough time to finish his guitar solo. Drooling. But it's all a dream he's having in class. Who didn't see that coming? Their science teacher is talking about insect biology. Buffy hasn't done the reading, so he asks her to stay after class. I gather you had a few problems at your last school. Can't wait to see what you're gonna do here. Destructo girl, it's me. But I suspect it's gonna be great. Dr. Gregory is the kind of teacher I loved when I was in school. He doesn't give up on Buffy. He knows that she's capable of better, and he pushes her to prove herself without ever talking down to her. It's an effective way for me to actually care about a character right before he gets eaten by a monster. Angel pays Buffy another visit, this time to warn her about a new vampire in town. But he gives her his jacket, which is actually something that's going to come up later on. It's a balmy night, no one needs to be trading clothing out there. The next day at school, they find out that Dr. Gregory's gone missing, and that their substitute teacher is a Miss Natalie French who has all the boys, including Xander, practically falling out of their seats to get close to her. Buffy tries to figure out what happened to Dr. Gregory, and when they find his body in a school closet, everyone mostly figures that it must have been the vampire angel warned them about. Until Buffy goes out to hunt him and finds him running away from Miss French in fear. And later, Miss French spins her head 360 degrees around. Right in full view of everyone in class, might I add. We are talking full-on exorcist twist. Xander doesn't believe there could be anything wrong with her, so he goes to Miss French's house to work on a school project. Teachers don't do that, right? You like Greek food? I I'm exempting shawarma, of course. I mean, what's that all about? It's a big meat hive. What is Joss's thing with shawarma? You ever tried shawarma? And while he's there, Buffy, Willow, and Giles do their research and figure out that Miss French is a giant praying mantis. And if you know anything about the maiden habits of the praying mantis, you know this isn't gonna end well for Xander. They're cannibals. Know the kind of budget they were working with this season? The praying mantis here is actually the same prop they used for the Nagroth in season one of Babylon 5. Both shows used the same makeup company, and it was a lot cheaper for them to use something that was already lying around than it was for them to make something new. Buffy rescues Xander, and we even get to see Angel for something other than than a cryptic warning. Anyway, you can have your jacket back. Looks better on you. 
Oh boy. Early on in the episode, Miss French goes on this big speech about how the praying mantis leads a solitary life. Forced to live alone. It's the way nature designed them. Noble, solitary, and prolific. Buffy is obviously disgusted by the whole thing, but there are times in this episode when it feels like part of Xander's crush on Miss French is the fact that she reminds him so much of Buffy. Buffy. <laughs> I love Buffy. Both Buffy and Miss French are women with superhuman strength, and neither one of them are able to hold on to a stable, normal relationship because of that. On the one hand, it feels kind of weird for them to go on the subject of predatory teachers this early in the game. It's just kind of dark, you know? But at the same time, I can't help but feel that Miss French was meant to foreshadow the reason why Buffy and Xander just won't work. Buffy's too strong for him, and Xander's far too human to be able to keep up with the Slayer. And if you watch the next episode immediately after the way that I did, it really starts to feel like the show is trying to spell out for you not only how Buffy is similar to Miss French, but the ways in which she's not a predator as well. I counted episode 5, Never Kill a Boy on the First Date, as one of the fluff episodes earlier. But that being said, we do get some plot progression. The master comes back, and this time he's searching for a vampire called the Anointed One, who's apparently prophesied to be the one to lead the Slayer into hell. Buffy couldn't care less, though. She's got a date. This tall, dark, and handsome block of wood is named Owen. His only character trait is being obsessed with Emily Dickinson. I lost my Emily. Dickinson. It's dumb, but I like her around. I was convinced that Buffy had to be bored by him eventually. It's not that I'm against him being a reader, it's just that I'm not convinced he reads anything else. The thing about Emily Dickinson I love is she's just so incredibly morbid. They keep trying to arrange a date, but it keeps getting delayed when Giles calls Buffy away to hunt for the anointed one. When our bland couple finally do go on a date and talk more about Emily Dickinson. Did she have a tragic and romantic life? Giles gets himself trapped in the Sunnydale morgue with a bunch of vampires. So Buffy has to sneak away with Xander and Willow to save him. And by the way, I love the use of the Sunnydale morgue in this episode. We never really see them use a setting like this again, and there's just something so cold and sterile about it, it really feels like a missed opportunity. Owen follows them, and he thinks it's so exciting that Buffy does things like this on the regular. He doesn't know anything about the vampires, though, and so he has no way to defend himself when this one one big vampire comes to attack them. You killed my date! You see, Giles thinks this big vampire is the anointed one, which is why he was at the morgue to begin with. He's not, but we'll find that out later. For now, all we know is that Buffy dusts the big guy. Owen's alright after all, a little bruised, but Xander and Willow help him home. Buffy's feeling like a total dolts after the whole thing, but it turns out that Owen actually wants to see her again. He's really into the idea that she's super exciting, which makes Buffy realize that he's going to get himself killed if they keep going out, and so she breaks it off. Owen will never be seen again. This is the first episode that really introduces a theme we're going to see play out for the rest of the series. That Buffy is really a sort of praying mantis in her own right. She's forced to live a solitary life for fear of getting others killed. But that being said, she isn't a predator like Miss French because she's able to recognize that quality in herself. Buffy will pursue human men after this point, but every time she does, her boyfriends are always revealed to be somehow mixed up in the supernatural, or at the very least, able to defend themselves. But for the most part, Buffy's boyfriends are usually monsters, and as a result of that, they're also usually emotionally or physically abusive. It's a pessimistic view of strong women, to say the least. To some degree, you could almost say that the thesis statement of Buffy's entire character is that strong women can never live an easy life. That strong women only attract toxic relationships, but that it's the mark of the strong woman that she's able to survive all of that. And look, I'm not trying to say that there isn't a certain amount of strength involved in surviving a toxic relationship. What I am saying is that priding yourself on your ability to withstand a toxic relationship can be a little toxic as well. 
In some cases, it can even turn into an excuse to keep staying in that relationship even when you know that it's actively hurting you. But it makes you stronger, so better keep doing it, I guess. Buffy's never able to find a healthy relationship on the show, and that's mostly on the shoulders of one particular character who at this point in time shall remain nameless. <laughs> Angel. And don't worry, we will be getting into that soon. But Buffy herself begins to exhibit some extremely toxic traits close to the end of the series. And by that point, you can kind of tell that she's not doing herself any favors in her search for love either. Trust me, things are gonna get rocky going forward. But for now, we gotta wrap up the episode. Buffy talks to Giles about how much it sucks to be the Slayer, and he comes back with our first clue that Giles never actually wanted to be a Watcher. He had other plans as a kid. I was gonna be a fighter pilot, possibly a grocer. But his dad talked him into joining the family business, and he's been studying demons ever since. And in our last scene, we find out that the Master has found the Anointed One after all, and that he looks like... Dun dun dun... A kid! We'll get back to the Anointed One in a little bit, but honestly, he's a lot of hype for not a lot of payoff. Episode 6 is called The Pack, and guys... We have were hyenas. <laughs> I talked about were hyenas a little bit in my Wolfman video, but honestly, my explanation was very simplified. I mentioned that were hyenas were stories from African folklore that involved people turning into hyenas using some form of witchcraft. But one thing that I didn't mention is that depending on where you are in Africa, you may also hear stories of hyenas with the ability to disguise themselves as humans. The Crocata is a mythical creature of Ethiopian folklore that's often been linked to hyenas. But legend describes the Crocata as being the result of a union between a wolf and a lioness, and claims that the Crocata is able to mimic the sound of a human voice perfectly. They're even known to call people by their name in the middle of the night just to get them alone and devour them. It is true to some degree that hyenas are very wolf-like in build, but their closest living relatives are actually things like the mongoose and civets. Hyenas are so unique that they actually belong to a family all their own, the hyenide family. Hyenas are also capable of very human-like vocalizations, most famously that laugh. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually a sound that they make when they're feeling either distressed or threatened. It's a sound that low-ranking animals make when they're either getting beaten up or afraid they won't get access to, to food. Keep that in mind for later. Hyenas have been known to feed on the corpses of humans, but generally speaking, so long as you leave them alone, they're a lot less likely to attack than a lot of big cats who share their territory. I love hyenas, and I blame this episode for my lifelong obsession with them. Seriously, any time that I'm at a zoo or animal sanctuary that has hyenas in it, I can just stand there for hours, pretending to make friends through the bars. Buffy and her friends go on a field trip to the zoo when they notice a group of bullies going into the closed-down hyena pen with their next victim. Xander follows them in because he figures that this situation doesn't require any slaying. But the whole encounter turns aggressive, which causes this animatronic hyena to possess all of the bullies and Xander. <laughs> that laugh will be used to imply that they're mocking people all episode. That is a gross misrepresentation of hyenas. Honestly, it makes me realize how much more suiting it is that Bud and Lou, Joker and Harley's pet hyenas, really become hers after the breakup. Sorry, little aside here. Hyenas don't laugh because something's funny. They laugh out of discomfort, which is a lot more suited to her character than I realized. But this episode makes hyenas out to be simple predators. And it is true that hyenas tend to avoid picking fights with anything they deem larger than them. They prefer to target easier prey, which is something that this episode uses very well. When Xander becomes possessed, he becomes rude and dismissive towards Willow, but he holds Buffy up on this weird pedestal in a I want to own her kind of way. Xander's taken to teasing the less fortunate. Uh huh. And uh, there's a noticeable change in both clothing and demeanor. Yes. Well, otherwise, all his spare time spent lounging about with imbeciles. It's bad, isn't it? It's devastating. 
He's turned into a 16-year-old boy. Xander is made out to be the leader of the pack, presumably because he was the one who was there to stop the bullies in the hyena pen. But among actual hyenas, it's the female who's the leader. Female hyenas tend to be a lot more dominant and aggressive than the males, and they also have a fully functioning phallus that they can use during mating with both male and female partners. I know none of this matters for the episode, it's just fascinating. And I'm surprised, considering how girl power the show claims to be, that they didn't think it would be interesting to include those details. No, instead we get the typical alpha male, and the best hyena trivia you're gonna get from this episode is... Apparently Noah rejected the hyenas from the Ark because he thought they were an evil, impure mixture of dogs and cats. Well, apparently, Noah was a dick. Okay, I gotta stop defending hyenas for a minute here and focus on the episode. But first, there's another character I need to introduce you to. Principal Flutie. He's actually been around since the first episode. I just haven't mentioned him before now because he's mostly just been there to do basic principal stuff. He's stereotypically shiny, happy, except he has this one blind spot when it comes to Buffy, because he's already convinced she's going to mess up from the moment he meets her. We're not interested in what it says on a piece of paper, even if it says, well... I know my transcripts are a little colorful. You burned down the gym. His story really wasn't going anywhere, though, so the writers just had him eaten by were hyenas. Are you insane? Xander at the time was with Buffy, so he wasn't there to kill Principal Flutie. He does eat a pig that the school keeps as their mascot, which I don't know if that was more of a thing back in the 90s, but how many high schools keep live pigs? But Xander's worst crime in this episode would probably have to be what he does instead of eating Principal Flutie. When he's with Buffy, he makes it clear that he wants her to be his mate. Then he forces himself on top of her right before she hits him with a desk. I hit him. With what? A desk. He tried to hand it felony sexual Assault. Look, I know that Xander was supposed to have been possessed when he did this, but can we stop writing men committing sexual assault while they're under some sort of spell that just excuses them for the whole thing? Because that makes me feel really yucky. Buffy locks Xander away in this cage that they conveniently have in the library. This cage will become a pretty big deal from this point going forward. It's also where they lock up Buffy's weapons so students at the school can't access them. Buffy and Giles leave Willow to watch Xander while they talk to the zookeeper about the hyenas. He puts all the blame on the hyenas. The zoo imported those hyenas from Africa. There was something strange about them from day one. Giles and the zookeeper talk about how this breed of hyena was historically worshipped by a group called primals, which is a suspiciously English-sounding name for an ancient group based out of Africa, who apparently got themselves possessed just for funsies. The zookeeper knows that some sort of ancient ritual was involved, but Giles fills him in on the rest by telling him that the kids were possessed when they engaged in a predatory act. Predatory act? Of course, that makes sense. Buffy agrees to lead the were hyenas back to the zoo, and as it turns out, it won't be hard to find them, because the pack is surrounding Willow, looking for Xander. Willow. Xander! Shut up! Everyone converges back at the zoo. The zookeeper lives his dream of becoming a werehyena by holding a knife to Willow's throat, successfully unpossessing the students, but he doesn't get to enjoy it for long because he gets tossed into the hyena pen. And this zoo apparently starves its hyenas. <laughs> Xander tells Buffy and Willow that he has no memory of being possessed, but the end of the episode makes it clear that his animal nature will come up again. I've been reading up on my uh, animal possession and I cannot find anything anywhere about memory loss afterwards. Did you tell them that? Your secret dies with me. Joss would later say that this episode taught him that the audience becomes more involved when one of the main characters is put in danger, so you'll definitely be seeing more of that going forward. Even episode 7 put a major character in the hospital, but Angel was a pretty big turning point for the series. This is one of those plot-heavy episodes I mentioned earlier. We open up on the master talking about how much he wants to kill Buffy. Darla volunteers to do it, you haven't forgotten her, have you? But the master suggests that Darla has some sort of personal grudge against Buffy we don't know about. You have a personal interest in this. I don't get to have any fun. And says that he's going to send the three instead. The three are basically what they sound like. They're a group of three tough vampires. That's it. The three attack Buffy when she's on her way home from the bronze, but Angel cuts in and the two of them run away to Buffy's house. 
Since the three are still lurking somewhere outside, and vampires can't come in unless you invite them, Angel has to stay the night. He sleeps on the floor by Buffy's bed, and the next day, she and Willow are all giddy about it. Did you, uh, I mean, did he, uh, perfect gentleman? Angel's still there when Buffy gets home. He says that he has to go, but they kiss instead. And Angel develops vampire face before jumping out the window. <laughs> That's right. Angel's a vampire. At first, our heroes don't know what that means either. We see Angel receive a visit from Darla, and it's clear that they have a past. But Darla also makes it clear that Angel's been drinking from blood packs instead of live humans. You're not exactly living off a quiche. Darla also mentions something about a curse, but leaves it there. Talk to her. Tell her about the curse. Maybe she'll come around. By the way, the three get dealt with easily because it turns out that every single time they fail, they offer their life in penance, so Darla kills them. Okay, there is no way there's only three of them if they do this every time. Unless they keep, like, cycling members out like a band or something. The gang starts reading up on Angel, and they find out that according to the history books, Angel's killed hundreds of people. He's also around 240 years old. And he kissed a 16-year-old. You can see how this dynamic went on to inspire stories like Twilight and The Ancient Magus's Bride, an honestly much better story that also deals with an immortal being in a relationship with a young girl. There's always an iffy sort Sort of power dynamic when it comes to these sorts of relationships, but we'll see how Buffy and Angel manage to handle it as the series goes on. And keep in mind, I used to ship Buffy and Angel when I was a kid. I used to think they were the cutest couple. We will see how my mind has changed. Darla stops by Buffy's house while Joyce is alone and manages to get herself invited in by telling Joyce that she's a friend of Buffy's. Darla bites Joyce, but Angel happens to be passing by and he rushes in to help her. Of course, Darla leaves Angel holding Joyce and Buffy comes in and gets the wrong idea. He makes no attempts to explain and accepts getting kicked out through the window. Now, it's personal. You're not welcome here. Joyce is going to be okay, but Buffy is resolved to kill Angel for what she thinks he did to her mother. Joyce, of course, doesn't mention that it was Darla, and instead just vaguely refers to Buffy's friend having been there when she lost consciousness. Your friend came over. I guess I slipped and cut my neck on. The doctor said it looked like a barbecue fork. We don't have a barbecue fork. Eventually, she does get around to asking Joyce Giles if Darla is okay. Darla, I, I don't believe I know. Her friend, the one who came over tonight. Poor thing, I must have frightened her half to death. Someone should really check and make sure she's all right. At which point they figure out that it wasn't Angel, but by then it's too late. Buffy's already gone and hunting Angel down in a shuttered bronze. I actually love the use of this set. I know it's the same one we've seen before, and by the way, the bronze set was just set up in an old warehouse. But at the same time, there's always something eerie about seeing a place that's usually filled with people all empty and dark like this for the first time. Angel explains to Buffy that when he first became a vampire, he killed his own family and anyone else he came across. For hundred years, I offered an ugly death to everyone I met, and I did it with a song in my heart. Then came the day that he killed a Romani girl, and this show definitely gets the Romani confused with witches. The Romani, by the way, are a group of real people of Indo-Aryan background who traditionally lived a more nomadic lifestyle. Although today, there are roughly as many Romani homeowners as there are non-Romani homeowners. You might even be more familiar with hearing them referred to by the slur that the characters on Buffy use all the time. Gypsies. You hear that slur in media even today. This is the work of gypsies. Historically, many Romani would offer things like fortune telling to make money. They also held a system of beliefs that would have felt a little unfamiliar to the majority European and Christian people who were making up these stereotypes at the time. And so the idea that Romani were witches was born, and it, along with many other stereotypes, have been used to continue persecuting them to this day. Like, as recently as 2012, broadcaster Ezra Levant from my home country of Canada went on 
on this big, huge rant on the source where he basically accused all Romani of being criminals. And I do want to read an excerpt from what he said, just because I think it does a decent job of summarizing how our culture tends to feel about the Romani, and also how Buffy the Vampire Slayer tends to depict them whenever they come up. But please keep in mind that these are not my words, these are as relevant. These are a culture synonymous with swindlers. The phrase and cheater have been so interchangeable historically that the word has entered the English language as a verb. He us. He goes on to say a bunch of other awful stuff that honestly doesn't deserve our attention. My main point here is this is how racists talk about the Romani. And whenever the Romani are brought up on the show, it's always with this same weird note of disdain and suspicion. But when you find out what the Romani did to Angel on the show, it honestly doesn't sound that bad. Vampires, we find out, don't have souls. This is what makes them capable of killing in the numbers that they do. When you you become a vampire the demon takes your body but it doesn't get your soul that's gone no conscience no remorse it's an easy way to live but after angel killed the nameless romani girl her family got together and cursed him to have a soul the reason why this is considered a curse and not a blessing is that he's now capable of feeling the guilt of having killed in the way that he did you have no idea what it's like to have done the things i've done in the care which to that i say good he should feel guilty. The Romani gave him a new shot at life. He has control over his faculties again. And yes, there are some other catches to the curse, but those don't even come up until season two, and trust me, I will be getting to those when we get there. At this point, the only thing that we know is that he's not a monster anymore, and the only thing he can do about it is whine and complain that the big bad Romani took his fun away. Buffy feels bad for him for some reason, but then Darla breaks in and makes it clear that she and Angel used to date in the past. Do you know what the saddest thing in the world is? Those prosthetics? To love someone who used to love you. But Darla's packing heat. Scary. Scarier. It's rare that you see someone using guns on this show. That isn't to say that it doesn't happen, especially when we come to season four and we get to the military stuff, but when it comes to the vampires on this show, this feels strange. Angel dusts Darla to protect Buffy, symbolically killing off his old life to make way for the new. That is, until Darla is brought back to life in Angel, but that won't be for a long time from now. After everything's said and done, Buffy and Angel meet up at the bronze again. They agree that it's probably best that they don't keep seeing each other, kiss, and part ways. But we see that Buffy's cross necklace has burned into Angel's chest, implying that she'll always be with him. I think. This episode's also responsible for doubling down on Willow's crush on Xander. That isn't to say that it wasn't brought up before, but this episode she absolutely cannot stop talking about him. Sometimes I have this fantasy that Xander's just gonna grab me and kiss me right on the lips. It is kind of cute. Willow's an easy favorite character, and it's hard not to cheer for her to get whatever she wants, even when you know that she deserves better than a guy who's still pining over the fantasy that is Buffy. And believe it or not, Willow does get a boyfriend of a sort in episode 8. I, Robot, you, Jane. This episode has not aged well. It tackles the subject of the internet and especially online dating, but keep in mind that it first aired April 28th, 1997. Just look at these bulky computers! We've seen the characters interact with computers before this, and Willow even had a great moment in episode 2 that I didn't bring up at the time time just because it's such a small scene, but it does a good job of showing us that Willow's supposed to be the techie one in the group. Excuse me? Who gave you permission to exist? Finally, the nightmare ends! Okay, so how do we save it? Deliver. Where's that? Oh! Episode 8 starts with Buffy, Willow, and Xander volunteering in the library to scan recently delivered books into their new computer system. They're joined by the computer lab class, which seems to just consist of two guys plus Willow. And then we're introduced to what is easily one of my favorite characters on this series, the computer lab teacher, Miss Calendar. She's a new age feminist who spends a lot of time arguing with Giles about which is better, books or computers. Their argument is pretty great 
actually, Miss Calendar brings up some good points. You think that knowledge should be kept in these carefully guarded repositories where only a handful of white guys can get at it. Nonsense. But skip into the end of the episode for a sec. Giles definitely wins when he gives a sentimental speech that's honestly one of my favorite moments this season. Honestly, what is it about them that bothers you so much? The smell. Computers don't smell, Rupert. I know. Smell is the most powerful trigger to the memory there is. Books smell musty and, 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 and rich. If it's to last, then, then the getting of knowledge should be uh, tangible. It should be um, smelly. Well, you really are an old-fashioned boy, aren't you? Well, I, I don't dangle a corkscrew from my head. That's not where I dangle it. Yeah, they were gonna fuck. It's only a matter of time, and I am so here for it. Giles and Miss Calendar are easily my favorite couple to come out of this season, and they are 100% responsible for my love of any relationship involving a strong woman and a nerd. But that's the B plot, which honestly is more interesting than the A plot. Willow starts dating some guy named Malcolm online, and Buffy and Xander are concerned because he could be anyone. Sure, he says he's a high school student, but I can say I'm a high school student. You are. Okay, but I can also say that I'm an elderly Dutch woman. I mean, who's to say I'm not if I'm in the elderly Dutch chat room? I get your point. I get your point. Which is definitely a legitimate concern to have, but honestly, this episode has only become funnier to me since I've met my current partner on Tinder. Obviously, meeting someone online always comes with risks, but there is a way to do it safely so long as you're aware. Like, for me, I was talking to B for months before we met in person, and I was hyper aware the entire time, looking for signs that I might be being catfished. Oh, this guy could be anybody. He could be a circus freak. He's probably a circus freak. I had the rule of meeting people in public places, like a coffee shop, for the first time. It's not a date, it's a caffeinated beverage. And no second locations, especially nowhere isolated, like a car or something like that. Relax. I'm not going to hurt you. Oh, it's not me I'm worried about. I do have complex post-traumatic stress disorder, so I do tend to go a little overboard when it comes to keeping myself safe. But at the same time, I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing, because these things do happen. And it's definitely better to be prepared than it is to regret it afterwards. The right people are always going to understand and respect your boundaries. But Willow never even seems to realize she could be in danger. She gets mad at Buffy for trying to control her life, and she even cuts class to talk to Malcolm. Which, if you know anything about Willow, is something she never does. Malcolm and I really care about each other. A big deal if I blow off a couple classes. I thought you said you overslept. Malcolm said you wouldn't understand. Speaking of cutting class, we get to see Buffy's Sunnydale record this episode. She's listed as having only one absence here, which seems weird to me. Joyce already said she's been called about Buffy skipping a few classes back in episode two. I got a call from your new principal. Says you missed some classes today. And episode 10 will make it seem as though Buffy has a habit of skipping classes. I don't know, but especially being the Slayer, I just expect that number to be higher. That isn't even the weird detail here either. Watch closely. Did you see it? The first time we see Buffy's record, she's listed as a sophomore, and her birthday is on October 24th, 1980. After the cut, Buffy suddenly aged up to a senior, and her birthday is on May 6th, 1979. Later episodes would celebrate Buffy's birthday around January 19th, and Joss would eventually settle on the birth date of January 19th, 1981. So, this entire school record is irrelevant. Other weird stuff starts going on with the computers at school. Students' essays are being rewritten. Nazi Germany was a model of a well-ordered society? I didn't write that. And nurses are making some pretty big mistakes. I checked the computer and there's nothing in this file about being allergic to penicillin. After the computer lab boys try to kill Buffy for nosing around, she figures out that they accidentally released a demon onto the internet when Willow scanned in the book he'd been trapped in by medieval monks. Now the demon has a nearby tech company building him a robotic body. Although this episode does a decent enough job of showing us how how much of a threat a demon on the internet would already be. He's in a computer. What can he do? How about mess up all the medical equipment in the world? Destroy the world's economy. Access launch codes for our nuclear missiles. Willow gets kidnapped by the computer kid, and so Buffy and Xander have to rescue her while Giles turns to Miss Calendar for help in exercising the demon from the internet. There's a demon in the internet. I know. 
You should see the bones I've been casting. The reveal that she's a witch is so subtle here, it's great. I don't have that kind of power. Techno-pagan is the term. So Miss Calendar's on the team, and she and Giles manage to trap the demon in his robotic body. Buffy takes him out, and all three of our heroes sit around the school fountain at the end, lamenting the fact that they can never find a normal relationship. The one boy I've had the hots for since I moved here turned out to be a vampire. Buffy, did you just forget about Owen entirely? Chad Lindbergh plays one of the computer kids in this episode, and he goes on to play another computer geek, Ash, in the series Supernatural. All business up front, party in the back. Xander makes his first mention of his uncle Rory here too. He's the one with all the knowledge about the tech company that's building the demon his robotic body because his uncle Rory used to work there. In a floor sweeping capacity. This episode also has what I consider to be one of Xander's best lines. Kids really dig the library, don't you? We're literary. To read makes our speaking English good. We'll be going now. Love it. Makes our speaking English is good. I panic, okay? This episode's memorable for introducing Miss Calendar, but otherwise it's just another fluff piece. Do you remember how I mentioned that Joss's dad worked with the Jim Henson company? Well, episode 9 is all about the fear of puppets. This isn't the last time the Buffyverse is going to do something like this either. There's a pretty memorable episode of Angel that draws more direct parallels to Sesame Street. The puppet show feels like it was inspired by Goosebumps more than anything. And not just because Sid here looks a lot like Slappy. Giles has been recruited to judge the school's upcoming talent show by their new principal, Principal Schneider. Or, as Giles puts it, Our new Fira, Mr. Schneider. Schneider is pretty great. He's one of those characters I didn't appreciate when I was younger because he's just supposed to be the strict principal. But honestly, he gets a lot of great lines in this episode. My predecessor, Mr. Flutie, may have gone in for all that touchy-feely relating nonsense, but he was eaten, and Sunnydale has touched and felt for the last time. There are things I will not tolerate. Students loitering on campus after school. Horrible murders with hearts being removed. And also smoking. Armin Shimmerman does a great job with this role. You may recognize him as Quark from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. He's just one of those actors who you've probably seen before and definitely don't appreciate enough. Schneider forces Buffy, Willow, and Xander to get more involved in the school by joining the talent show. Even though in the last episode they were actively volunteering in the library, so they seem pretty involved in their specific interests already. But that's not enough for Schneider. They have to watch as one of the kids at the talent show practices with his dummy, which freaks Buffy out, but thankfully he's not very good. Hi, I'm Morgan. And I'm Sid! until suddenly he is. All right, time out. You call those jokes? My jockey shorts are made out of better material. <laughs> and they're edible. Sid's dirty dummy shtick gets to be a little much, especially when you find out what's actually going on with him. When one of the performers at the talent show turns up with her heart cut out, Buffy thinks it must have been Sid the dummy, but everybody else is convinced that Buffy just has a fear of dummies. Sid sneaks into Buffy's room one night, but Xander suggests that it might have just been a cat. But when I turned the lights on, it was already gone. I, I think it went out my window. Like a cat? Yeah. No, it was Sid, the dummy. Eventually, Giles comes across in his research a type of demon that collects human parts in order to appear fully human. Buffy is attacked by Sid, who, as it turns out, can talk on his own, and he's convinced Buffy is the type of demon that she's been hunting. You lost, and now you'll never be human. Yeah, well, neither will you. What? What? Sid, we find out, isn't a demon at all, but a regular human who was cursed by demons to live in the body of a dummy. Now he hunts down the demons in an effort to end his curse. This one at Sunnydale should be the last one, meaning he'll be set free afterwards. And if it isn't Sid, and it isn't Buffy, then that means that it has to be one of the other students at the talent show. You thought I was the demon. Who can blame me for thinking? Look at you. You're strong, athletic, limber, nubile. That is a grown-ass man talking to a teenage girl. How do you feel about his dirty puppet shtick now? If you want to snuggle up and comfort me. So that horny dummy thing really isn't an act, is it? Nope. 
Yuck. I couldn't help but notice, watching this episode again, that they really set Schneider up as a red herring here. He keeps lurking about all episode, and there's even this weird shadowy shot of him that I can't explain right before Giles gets kidnapped. Yeah, Giles gets kidnapped by the actual demon, who turns out to be this random kid we've only seen glimpses of before now. You were supposed to leave. He tries to cut out Giles' brain, but of course Buffy saves the day. And the episode ends with the gang given the most awkward performance of Oedipus Rex ever. Madness and stabbing pain and, and, um, oh... Love it. That run off the stage was ad-libbed by Alison Hannigan, too. The network apparently sent the writers a note asking for the Oedipus scene to be taken out, which apparently read, We realize that it's Shakespeare, but does he have to talk about sleeping with his mother? They prophesied that I should kill my father, but he is dead. But surely I must fear my mother's bed. Oedipus Rex isn't Shakespeare, it's Sophocles. And it was written around 2,000 years before Shakespeare was even born. Willow's fear of the stage comes up again in episode 10, Nightmares. Which, upon rewatch, was definitely the best episode of season one, in my opinion. It dives really deep into the characters, and especially into the relationship between Buffy and her dad, who hasn't really come up much on the show to this point. We know that her parents got divorced, but this episode has her preparing to go away for the weekend with them. Buffy's a lot more nervous than we're used to seeing her, and Sarah Michelle Gellar does a great job of selling her feelings. Honey, are you worried your father isn't gonna show? No. Not really. Should I be? Buffy, Willow, and Xander get to class, but their lecture is quickly interrupted when another student opens his textbook and a bunch of spiders crawl out. Everyone starts screaming, and Buffy looks up to see a little boy. Sorry about that. That's our setup here, just a couple of spiders crawling out of a textbook. No, oh, and Giles gets lost in the stacks. I was uh, in the stacks, got lost. Anthony Head does a great job of selling his fear here. I wonder what happened to him back there. Our heroes go to the spider kid to ask him about what happened, and he says that he has reoccurring nightmares about spiders ever since his brother left the heat lamp on too long and killed his pet spiders when he was a kid. There's nothing to say. You saw 200 insects. You gonzoed. Anybody would have. They're not insects. They're arachnids. They're from the Middle East? Xander, if you're gonna be racist, at least make it make sense. This gets interrupted by Buffy finding out that she suddenly has a test for a class she's never attended before. Remember what I said about her skipping classes? It's a history test, too, and Buffy keeps bringing up the fact that she's bad at history all season. Are we gonna talk about boys or are we gonna help you pass history? So, yeah, I tend to believe that she's not actually attending this class very much. The test seems to fly by way too fast, though, and when it's over, Buffy sees that little boy again. It actually takes it takes a while for our heroes to even figure out that something's going on in this one. It isn't until another student at school gets savagely beaten do they realize that there's a monster in town. Lucky 19. And they go to pay her a visit to ask if there was anything strange about what happened to her. Lucky 19. It's what he said right before. That's weird, right? The doctor tells Buffy and Giles that the girl actually got off pretty lucky, and that the first victim of this guy is still in a coma. Buffy doesn't realize it until she sees his picture in the newspaper, but this is actually the kid that she keeps seeing around school. He's been astral projecting ever since he was put in his coma, and unleashing everyone's nightmares upon Sunnydale. Ow! Gotta wake up! <laughs> and so it's up to Buffy to figure out what happened to him so they can stop the nightmares. The nightmares in this episode are a mix of funny... Oh, there's my little baby! Mom, what are you doing here? Please, don't kiss me for everybody. This is embarrassing, Mom. <laughs> Cultural appropriation... Liberty. And legitimately scary. <laughs> but Buffy certainly earns the reward for a most psychologically scarring nightmare. She sees her dad come to the library to pull her aside just to tell her that he doesn't want to see her anymore and that it was her fault that he left in the first place. You get in trouble. You're sullen and rude and you're not nearly as bright as I thought you were going to be. Hey, Buffy, let's be honest. Could you stand to live in the same house with a daughter like that? I know that we're supposed to read this as none of it haven't been real. It was all just a nightmare, and Buffy's dad would never actually say any of this. 
but I don't think that we spend enough time with Buffy's dad to actually forgive him for this moment. You'll see what I mean in a bit. For now, I like that the fact that Buffy lives with trauma means that she's at higher risk when nightmares become real, because her nightmares are just so much more intense than the average person's. Buffy doesn't know this is happening, and given the sort of thing that she tends to dream about, it's imperative that we find her. Giles, Willow, and Xander band together once things start getting bad to find Buffy. She's been hanging out with Coma Boy's astral projection, hearing out his story, and running away from something he calls the ugly man but they wind up getting separated by her fear of the master. This isn't real. Y you can't be free. I am free because you fear it. He buries Buffy alive, which is actually a fear that Sarah Michelle Gellar struggles with in real life. It made it even harder for her to film the graveyard scenes. So it's a good thing that Buffy is 80% graveyard scenes. When Giles and the gang come across her tombstone, Buffy's birth year is written as 1981. That is her actual birth year, but that is neither of the birth years that appear on her school record. Giles tells us that this is his nightmare to lose his slayer. I failed in my duty to protect you. I'm sorry. But at that moment, Buffy suddenly rises as a vampire. Oh god. Buffy. Don't look at me. The vampire prosthetics never got good this season, but vampire Buffy is something I wish we'd gotten to see more of. I don't know, there's just something a little extra badass about this to me. Scary. I'll tell you something though, there are a lot scarier things than you, and I'm one of them. They all converge at the hospital, and this is the moment where the special effects really fall apart. Buffy beats up the ugly man, but it's up to the kid to unmask him. The kid wakes up, and he names his kitty league coach as the one who put him in a coma after a losing game. You said it was my fault that we lost. It wasn't my fault. This reveal sort of feels like it's meant to parallel Buffy's relationship with her dad. Both Buffy and the kid are victims of blame that they didn't deserve, and they both need to learn that it's not their fault if someone else responds badly to a situation. Think about that as she bounces off with them all happy at the end of the episode. When Buffy was a vampire, you weren't still like attracted to her, were you? Are you kidding, Will? I was more attracted to her. Allison Hannigan was actually the one who put Joss onto the band Nerf Herder, which is why their merch can be seen hanging in Willow's locker. Just a cool little detail there. Cordelia appears in the background of this episode, sort of like she's done all season. In Nightmares, we see her fear of bad hair days and being forced to join the chess team. In the puppet show, Cordelia sang a cover of The Greatest Love of All by Whitney Houston. Badly, I might add. I decided long ago never to walk in anyone's shadows. But episode 11 is really the first one that tries to tell us a little bit about her, besides that she's just popular and mean. Out of sight, out of mind. Strike that. Reverse it. She opens up on Cordelia planning her campaign for May Queen, something that Xander thinks is ridiculous. Yeah, what kind of moron would I be May Queen anyway? I was. You what? At my old school. Oh, so the uh, good kind of moron would do that. Buffy explains that she used to be a lot like Cordelia back at her old school. Xander and Willow just kind of go on laughing about memories. <laughs> You really see how Buffy still feels like an outsider here. I've definitely been in Buffy's place before, being the newest addition to an already established friend group and feeling like the least valuable member there. Except in Buffy's case, that's definitely not true. Buffy and the gang get interrupted when they find out that Cordelia's boyfriend was beaten in the locker room by an invisible person with a baseball bat. Maybe it's a vampire bat. I'm alone with that one, huh? Buffy goes to talk to Cordelia about it, and her best friend Harmony is pushed down the stairs by someone unseen. Buffy tries to follow the sounds of this invisible person, and it leads her back to a nest where it seems like someone's been squatting for a while, and she finds an old Sunnydale yearbook. The invisible person considers stopping Buffy, but decides against it. Buffy takes the yearbook, and she learns that it used to belong to a Sunnydale student who was so unpopular she felt like she was invisible. 
So that's what she became. This was one of those things that was apparently caused by the hellmouth beneath the school just randomly spurting out mystical energy, so goes to show you how Sunnydale isn't like other schools. The Invisible Girl has a grudge against Cordelia for being so popular. Cordelia didn't do anything to her specifically, she just kind of ignored her. I know, but did you see his toupee? I mean, it was like the worst. <laughs> We're talking, okay? Which is what everybody did. Why she singles Cordelia out, I cannot tell you. What I can tell you is that the Invisible Girl is played by Clea Duval from But I'm a Cheerleader. Five, six, seven, eight, don't run from me cause this is fate which is easily the cutest rom-com ever, don't at me. Buffy begrudgingly takes on the charge of protecting Cordelia. But when the two of them are alone, they have a bit of a heart-to-heart -heart about how you can still feel lonely even when you're surrounded by people. People just wanna be in the popular zone. Sometimes when I talk, everyone's so busy agreeing with me, they don't hear a word I say. This was the moment that made a lot of audiences absolutely fall in love with Cordelia. She goes on to be a pretty important character from here, but this is really the first time that we got to see her as more than a bully. And it's definitely interesting to me, watching this time around, to realize how much more the writers empathize with the Invisible Girl's bullies in this episode than they do with the Invisible Girl. You know, I really felt sorry for you. You've suffered. There's one thing I really didn't factor into all this. You're a thundering loony. The invisible girl kidnaps Buffy and Cordelia, planning to carve up Cordelia's face like a jack-o'-lantern before she can take the stage as May Queen. Buffy manages to fight back by staying real quiet and listening for the invisible girl's movements. But at the last minute, some government agents drop by and take the invisible girl away, telling Buffy, We can rehabilitate her. In time, she'll learn to be a useful member of society again. The last scene in this episode shows us that someone is training an army of invisible people who are never explained to work as government agents that we never see again. Government agents hunting monsters will become more of a theme in season four, but this will be the last hint we'll see of invisible people until season six when Buffy becomes invisible, but that's a whole different series of events, okay? Cordelia is really the main takeaway from this episode, and I wanted to take a moment to talk about Charisma Carpenter here, just because she probably is the Buffy actress who's had the most to say about Joss Whedon. Other actors have definitely agreed with what she had to say, even Sarah Michelle Gellar called it a toxic work environment, but Charisma Carpenter has probably been the most forthcoming when it comes to details. And we won't be getting into a whole lot of those details until we get to certain plot points that come up in the spin-off series Angel, so there's still a bit of time before we get to that. For now, Charisma only really joined the discussion after Joss's ex-wife published an open letter about him on The Wrap in which she accused Joss of being a hypocrite preaching feminist ideals, going on to explain how he emotionally abused her throughout their relationship and had several affairs, including on the set of Buffy. Ray Fisher and Gal Gadot accused Joss Whedon of behavior that was gross, abusive, unprofessional, and completely unacceptable, in Fisher's words, on the set of Justice League. At which point, Charisma Carpenter joined the discussion and revealed that Joss had a history of being casually cruel going on to explain some of the things that he did during filming for season four and five of Angel. I don't want to speculate on what Charisma or any of the other actors may have been going through at the time. I don't know any of them personally, that is not why I'm making this video. I'm making this video to break down what Buffy has meant to me and many other fans out there, and I'm not trying to say that their suffering was worth it or anything stupid like that. In all honesty, they should have been able to make the show without having to deal with a tyrant man-baby as their lead creator. What I am trying to do is validate the experience of everyone who grew up loving this show and maybe call it out for the ways that it hasn't aged as well in the years that have passed. I will bring up actors' stories when they come up, partly because I think it's important to be aware of what the actors had to go through, but also because it's part of what makes Buffy Buffy, if we're being honest here. A lot of the behind the scenes drama would occasionally bleed out on screen, and as much as that may not be how it should work, it is more common than you would think on a lot of these lawn running productions. But we still have one episode to talk about, Prophecy Girl, the one where Buffy dies for real. 
Let me explain. In the last episode, we saw Angel give a rare book to Giles that's said to include the most complete prophecies about the Slayer. Episode 12 starts out with Giles reading our previously mentioned Anointed One prophecy. The Master shall rise and the Slayer my God. That's right. Not only is it the end of the world, which is signaled with an earthquake, in California, even the show will point out how common this is later. Something horrible's gonna happen, Giles. It was an earthquake, Buffy, a not uncommon occurrence in Southern California. But not only that, Buffy is prophesized to die. Giles and Angel try to figure out what to do without telling her at first, but of course, Buffy walks into the library just as they're saying the exact wrong thing. This is the Codex. There is nothing in it that does not come to pass. Tomorrow night, Buffy will face the master and she will die. This easily has to be Sarah Michelle Gellar's strongest scene in season one. I quit. You can find someone else to stop the master from taking over. Buffy, if the master rises... I don't care! Buffy's reaction to hearing that she's supposed to die is so human, it makes me tear up every time. Giles, I'm 16 years old. I don't want to die. This episode also wraps up our little love square between our heroes. Xander asks Buffy out, and she says that she only sees him as a friend. Xander does not take it well. I, mean, I guess the guy's gotta be undead to make time with you. Promiscuity leads to increased standards such as being undead. I really don't like how casually hostile Xander becomes towards Buffy here. I'm sorry, I don't handle rejection well. Funny, considering all the practice I've had, huh? He's an overall endearing character, and especially with some of the things that are revealed about him later, I don't expect him to act like a perfect person. I'm just saying that if I were Buffy, his response would make me feel worse than having to reject him already did. I can't help but feel that he's trying to guilt trip her into saying yes, either intentionally or unintentionally. Buffy's just way too strong-willed a person to give in to that, but if it were me, honestly, it would at least make me want to question if I wanted to continue this friendship, especially so early into it. Xander sort of gets a free pass for this because of something that he does later in the episode, but we'll talk about that when we get there. First, we have to watch a rejected Xander ask Willow out on a pity date. And kudos to her, her answer is perfect. No. Good. What? I think I want to go to the dance with you and watch you wish you were at the dance with her. Good on you, Willow, for having the self-respect to say no to your dream guy because you knew he wasn't asking for the right reasons. That's an attitude I think we all could aspire to. Willow really is an easy favorite, which is probably part of the reason why the writers chose her to be the one who walks in on our next sign of the impending apocalypse, a bloodbath at the school caused by the master's servants. According to Alice and Hannigan, they filmed two different versions of this scene, a tamer version to be shown in America and a bloodier one for Europe. I'm not sure which version we got here in Canada, but I do remember this scene feeling a lot gorier to me when I was a kid, but maybe that was just because I was a kid watching it. Willow tells Buffy that walking in on this was unlike anything she's had to do hunting monsters before, and you can really tell that she's lost a certain an amount of innocence here. I go to that room every day. It wasn't our world anymore. They made it theirs and they had fun. Buffy knows she can't just sit by and let the apocalypse happen, so she puts on the dress that she was meant to wear to the school dance, fully knowing that she's meant to die in it instead. Buffy, I like your dress. Buffy meets up with the anointed one, and even though they've been making this whole big deal about how she won't be able to recognize him when she sees him for the first time, she does, and they just walk calmly underground. So, uh, that whole prophecy about the anointed one leading the slayer into hell? That was an exaggeration, wasn't it? Buffy faces off against the master, but he hypnotizes her and explains that Buffy coming to him was the final step in fulfilling the prophecy that would set him free and bring about the end of the world. He drinks Buffy's blood, returning him to full power, and leaves her unconscious, lying face down in a pool. By the way... I like your dress. Angel and Xander burst in, having heard from Willow and Giles that Buffy is going to face the master. Buffy's already dead, but Xander suggests that they try CPR. CPR? Yeah, have to do it. I have no breath. 
this is the moment I mentioned before, where Xander apparently redeems himself for his bad response to Buffy's rejection. We see that he may not be boyfriendly to Buffy, but he's still an important person in her life because he cares enough to be there when she needs someone. And he proves this by potentially copping a feel while Buffy's vulnerable. Look, I'm not saying that's what he's doing here, but dude goes straight for the kiss of life and gives the lamest little chest compressions I've ever seen. I'm not even sure his hands are in the right place, they seem way too relaxed to me. The swelling music definitely makes it feel like Xander just got one. And all that feels really gross when A, we already know that Buffy isn't consenting, and B, she's literally a corpse right now. This is probably one of those moments I wouldn't have thought a whole lot about if it wasn't for the recent accusations about Joss making me extra scrutinize every second about my favorite show all over again. So maybe this is just me being crazy, it's just something I couldn't help but notice that made me feel kind of yucky. Meanwhile, Giles, Willow, Cordelia, and Miss Calendar all wind up cornered in the library with vampires coming at them from the outside and demons bursting out of the hellmouth within. Fun fact, this season's budget didn't allow for CGI, so special effects company Optic Nerve built a full-on costume for this demon. Every tentacle actually has a human inside of it. Plus, the sounds this demon makes are the same sounds you'll hear from the velociraptors in Jurassic Park. <laughs> Another movie I was obsessed with as a kid. Clever girl. But Buffy, Xander, and Angel do their cool guy walk to save the day. I think that most Buffy fans actually call it a hero walk when major characters on the show all align like this and charge forth to save the day. But I've been calling it a cool guy walk since I was a kid and I refuse to back down now. Oh look, a bad guy. <laughs> Buffy faces off against the master, who's his usual over-the-top, cheesy, movie villain self. You were destined to die, it was written. But Buffy couldn't care less. What can I say? I've long written. Another example of how Joss's writing style somehow just works better on Buffy. And yes, both this episode and the first two, which are the ones that inspired me to go on this rant last time, are credited as being written by Joss. Prophecy Girl was even directed by Joss, although this was the first time on the series he'd officially step into the director's chair. Buffy throws the master through the library's glass ceiling, which seems to be something high schools just had in the 80s and 90s, I don't know. Or maybe that's another American thing I don't get. But he gets staked through the heart by a conveniently placed splinter of wood and goes all dusty. Our heroes all gather around to notice that Buffy's not dead, and they all decide to crash the school dance since Buffy's already dressed for it anyway. By the way, I really like it. Yeah, dress. yeah. It's a big hit with everyone. I am so glad that they continue this storyline in season two because otherwise, this slow pan down to the master's bones would almost feel shallow. Season 1 isn't what the series would become in the long run. It's episodic, the characters don't feel as deep, and the special effects are definitely something they struggled with. But at the same time, I think I remembered season 1 as being a lot worse than it really is. There are some funny lines this season, and some genuinely good moments, whether it be the emotion that Sarah Michelle Gellar shows when she knows she's about to die. I don't want to die or just the fun of getting to see a whole new creature every episode. The series never really has the same kind of anything can happen feel again, and as much as I can understand that they needed to refine the lore over time, it's also kind of fun to just see where the series is going to take you. Season 1 isn't what the show would become, but it's still a far cry from the movie. As much as I enjoyed the movie, you can see why expectations were low for this series when it was first announced, and how Season 1 really brought audiences around to thinking there could be more here. But if you thought season one was dark, just wait until we get to season two. Special thanks to my supporters on Patreon, Ericobia, Arietta Crafty Bryant, Justin East, and Wilson Elrics III. If you'd like to become a part of our little monster squad, just know that everybody's welcome. Hitting that subscribe button is a surefire way to become a member, but the Patreon link is there in the video description if you'd like to receive some bonus perks along the way. Things like early access to videos and scripts, and your name called out at the end. Until next time, my friends.